South Africa never got a Marshall Plan. After the war, Europe was rebuilt because America put up big money to rebuild Europe. Africa has never got that opportunity. My interview with the former Ghanaian president, John Mahama, on a possible run for the presidency and why he wants to see a Marshall Plan for Africa. In our new segment, The Reporters, journalists discuss developing trends on the continent. Are more leaders respecting term limits and handing over power peacefully? And why is democracy struggling to take root in some parts of West Africa? Straight Talk Africa starts now. Hello there and welcome. I'm Heidi Adams. Thank you so much for joining me. We begin our show with a new segment, The Reporters, where VOA correspondents join me to discuss coverage of developing stories and trends from across the continent. And joining me here in studio today are two of my VOA colleagues. Vincent McCory is the managing editor for television in VOA's English to Africa service. And Idrissa Fall is a journalist in VOA's French to Africa news service. Gentlemen, warm welcome to you. I just first of all want to apologize for my voice. It's a little um, croaky as you can see. But, um, you know, we'll continue nevertheless and see how far we get. Um, I want to have a chat about some of the recent developments we've been seeing on the continent. And this is an opportunity for us to sort of take a little bit of a bird's eye view and stories that really stood out for us in our coverage. Uh, Vincent, I just quickly want to start out um, with you on the peace talks between the Ethiopian government and Tigrayan leaders scheduled. This was scheduled for October 8th in South Africa under the auspices of the African Union. Both sides had apparently agreed to, to sit down, but then those talks did not happen, they were postponed. What are we to read into that postponement? Yeah, first, uh, there was so much excitement when it was heard that both sides have uh, accepted an invitation by the African Union uh, to lead talks uh, that were to happen somewhere in South Africa. And so there was a build up to that excitement and that right. finally they're going to be, there's gonna be a, sort of a, a truce and hopefully a, you know peace returning to that country because it has been a long time uh, coming. And then just about a day before the actual weekend uh, that it was supposed to take place, uh, there was a statement that the talks had been delayed because of logistical reasons. Now, we were all looking to try to get an, an understanding of what were these logistical uh, reasons, and that was never explained. And uh, it made everybody start now wondering about the whole process of preparing for this uh, talks uh, in the first place. Initially, there was not so much information provided by the Africa Union uh, about the talks, but even the place where they were going to take place, they were going to take place somewhere in South Africa, but right. no details had been provided initially. So it, uh, even with a lot of inquiry, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, questioning, there was no detailed information given as to what were these logistical reasons. And so there has been a lot of uh, speculation as to whether it was the fact that uh, perhaps uh, the invitation might have been so hurried, nobody, the communication between the two sides that are involved in this conflict hadn't been solidly uh, you know, put in place in terms of the modalities of these mm. talks and the terms of the talks, because we know the two sides have been haggling over the terms of any truce or peace talks. And so there is a lot of fuzziness about the whole process and the whole uh, organization of those peace talks. And up to this moment, we have to say, uh, there's not so much clarity as to why they have been delayed and if they've been delayed to when you know right. and and the lack mm. of the the answers to those questions has created a little uh, you know a cloud over the process as well, to whether is it this? is going to take place and when 
But one can't help but wonder what this means for any sort of momentum towards peace and, and the AU's ability to get traction on these issues. I mean, um, former Nigerian President Olusegun Obasanjo, he's been tasked with leading the negotiations, and of course, former President of Kenya, Uru Kenyatta, and the former Deputy President of South Africa, Pumzile Mlambo um, th This sort of team, um, they are sort of heading these talks. Does that help lend credibility? Um, to the African Union um, as a, a, a fair and, and an honest broker in this? And, and do the two sides in Ethiopia um, believe the, a, the AU can actually pull this off? First, you have to recognize that actually there have been also other uh, conversations even outside of the continent. The United States has been, right. uh, you know, behind the scenes talking to the Ethiopians and, the, and to the region, uh, you know, to try and push the sides to, uh, you know, a table, a, a, you know, peace... Uh, peace talks of, of, right. of some sort. And, and even with those uh, kind of uh, uh, talks behind the scenes by the United States and other uh, you know, actors, it hasn't uh, borne fruit. Now, when it comes to the African Union, uh, it has always been a very, very uh, disturbing to most across the continent why the African Union cannot sit with their own member or members and talk about you know, peace on the continent. So while this um, you know, are considered credible, uh, you know, um, negotiators in this in these talks, whether it's the Kenyan former president or former Nigerian president, Olesha Gunon Basanjo. Uh, this, uh, the, the Ethiopia is, is part of the Africa Union. The Africa Union is actually headquartered in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. Right. And it baffles many as to why and uh, why it has become impossible for the Africa Union to resolve it is on its own issues within, uh, you know, within the instruments that they have at the African Union, because they do have the instruments to deal with such crises. But also, these negotiators, these mediators or special envoys are supposed to be, you know, their brothers on the continent. Right. So why it has become so difficult to put the sides, uh, the, you know, the different sides around the table and talk about peace has been a baffling thing to most observers across the continent. Well, we're going to keep an eye on that and see how things pan out there. I want to move a little bit to recent developments we've seen in West Africa. Africa. Idrissa, Burkina Faso um, ended the last month and kicked off the new month um, of October with a coup. Um, the second so far this year, a deposing president, Paul Henri Damiba, who himself came to power in a, in a coup last January. Um, but we've also seen successive coups in Mali, in neighboring Mali, um, in, in both countries, secure, insecurity was cited as the reason for these coups happening. Are we looking at a cycle of coups that might just not have an end here? Well, I think people don't know what's going to happen next because in uh, Burkina Faso, Ibrahim Traore, who is in power right now, I think he's going to begin trying to find a new president by next Saturday. He said that everything is urgent. He want to go back to the front, fight those jihadists, is what they say. And uh, it's not something new, because even in Mali, whenever you have a coup, the guy will come, yes, I will not stay here. I'm going to fight the jihadists. And then they keep sitting right. there for a little while. So it's different for Guinea. But Guinea also, people tend to forget that all these countries we are talking about, democracy had been like a bracket. It never been the norm. Mm -hmm. In Burkina Faso, former Old Volta, whoever come there, come to power using a coup. And when you say, Idrissa, the norm, is it that people accept that as how power changes hands through a coup? If, if you look at the map in West Africa, besides Senegal, besides Senegal, mm -hmm. which is a kind of exception, a coup had been the norm in Mali, they have a little period of what they call democracy, meaning holding elections. And I doubt that holding elections only can mean democracy. And it did not last. And uh, the same for Niger also. Right. And uh, the last pre the actual president, Bazoum, he came to power democratically, elected, but he knows himself that his country, the way to take power was to military takeovers. We have coups in Niger, a lot of coups, a lot of coups in Mali, a lot of coups in Burkina Faso. And uh, 
Now the, the existence of this jihadist group does not help at all. When the military should go fight the jihadists, they are in Ouagadougou, uh, buying some political transition and appointing themselves president. And uh, these guys, they control 6% of the territory. Right. And it countries at war. Is there something to be said, though, for these coups we are seeing and the fact that these, um, many of these were former French colonies? Well, if you look at history, I take the biggest one country called South Africa is Anglophone and is Correct. one of the most populated uh, country in Africa. There, too, they love coups. Yeah. Most of the people who arrive in power, besides the bracket of a democratic election with uh, Olusogun Obasanjo, and even the guy who's living in a few days, Muhammad Buhari, mm -hmm. people tend to forget he arrived there by a coup. Well, I, I do know in South Africa this, this fear of an insurrection in whatever form or shape it may take is, is always there. And, and Idris was talking about Muhammadu Buhari, yeah. one uh, um, of, of a few leaders we've seen. Mo Buhari, I mean, it's now general news that this is going to be the end of his term. Um, but we've seen presidents hand over power respecting term limits in, in some parts of the continent. Yeah. Um, is that a trend that we're maybe uh, not paying enough attention to that we're seeing? In, in yeah, yeah. I, I mean, as Idrissa, um, you know, points to, it's true. There was a period in Africa where there were so many coups across, you know, Francophone and, uh, you know, Anglophone countries and uh, even the, the former Portuguese colonies. But what we are seeing, there's a trend that is, you know, has grown uh, where the militaries are going to where they belong, to the barracks. And uh, the right. civilian mm -hmm. rules are becoming the norm. I know even in Nigeria, when you look at it now, it, right now it's unthinkable that a military will overthrow the government there. In Ghana, probably the last person we ever associated with the military uh, was, was Jerry uh, Rawlings. Uh, Jerry Rawlings. Mm. After that, now it is unthinkable that Ghana can slide not, not back even to a that. discussion. It in is. Some countries. So we are seeing more and more, and especially former Anglophone countries, actually becoming, um, you know, entrenched in democratic transitions and civilian rule mm -hmm. to the extent that it's it's almost unthinkable to see the military coming into into power. But of course, the, 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 I think that. Uh, that, that aspect still kind of has reared its head again in the former French colonies in West Africa. And some of the people have said, I've observed that there is external um, interference. There's in external okay. interference. We've seen protests against, for example, the French. And, and there's and, talk of <laughs> Russia being <laughs> involved as well. Yeah, yeah. But I just quickly, as a last question, and just very briefly, is there something to be read into the age of these guys? We always talk about how we want younger leadership on the continent. When you see a young coup leader, it's not exactly you know the picture many people had in mind but um, is there something to be read into how young you know Ibrahim um, Traore was born in 1988 and some um, have have noted in international media that he is now the youngest leader in the world but uh, he's not the first one people tend to forget another guy named Thomas Sankara uh -huh. arrived in power he was very very young People tend to forget that in a noble country called the Democratic Republic of Congo, right. uh, everybody there <laughs> named Mobutu, who, whoever you want, they arrive in power very, very young. And even in uh, Chad, right. the guy who was appointed president of the, the transition, of I doubt he is 35. No, he's right. around 30. He's a general, five. Star, so. Right, so we'll see where these younger leader, the leaders take us. This was a fascinating conversation. Yeah. I wish we had more time, gentlemen. I'll invite you both back. Idrissa Fall from VOA's French to Africa service and Vincent McCory from VOA's English to Africa service. Gentlemen, thank you for your time. Thank you. And we're going to take a short break. After the break, my interview with Ghana's former president, John Mahama, on why he wants to see a Marshall Plan for Africa. We'll have that interview for you after the break. Well, we bring you the latest news and development from Africa. Politics, health, tech, 
and everything in between. We are on it. Our network of reporters and analysts are on hand to add perspective to all our reports. Join me, Esther Githu Ewart, Monday through Friday, right here on VOA's Africa 54. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Linoch Mudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living. Right here on VOA. Welcome back to Straight Talk Africa. If you thought Ghana's former president, John Mahama, would fade into the distance after leaving office in 2017, you would be wrong. He has been a vocal critic of current president Nana Akufo Addo's handling of the economy, a financial crisis that has seen the country now turn to the International Monetary Fund for help. Mahama's own critics would point to the challenges he faced as president in trying to grow Ghana's economy. Is the former president eyeing a comeback? He visited the United States recently and I had a chance to sit down and speak with him here in Washington. I began by asking Mahama about his political plans for the future. Mr. Mahama, the next presidential election in Ghana will be in 2024. Um, have you officially thrown your hat in the ring? Do you plan to run again? Uh, no, I haven't, Heidi. <laughs> well, you know, word on the street, <laughs> let me put it that way. <laughs> well, it's good to keep your opponent guessing. And so even if I'm not running, I'm not going to say I'm not running. <laughs> so um, a decision will be taken early next year in the first quarter. Uh, that's when we hold our party's primaries for the presidential candidacy, and uh, we'll see. So at this point, you say you can neither confirm nor deny? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so, you know, um, turning to the situation in the country, and you have been very outspoken about the economic turmoil that you are seeing um, in Ghana. The country is enduring deep economic problems, yeah. rampant inflation. Now, of course, this is not unique to Ghana. We're seeing this globally. Um, but we saw protests in the country in June against yeah. the high cost of living. Yeah. And you've, for a long time, called on the government to accept assistance from the IMF. Yeah. It has now changed course yeah. and has turned to the International Monetary Fund yeah. for help. But Mr. Mahama, you also came under fire about how you handled the economy during your tenure. Should you have a chance to lead your country mm. again, mm. what would you do differently mm. that you didn't do the first time around? What would you do differently next time? I'll just, I'll just um, say something a, a, a little bit to look at the two circumstances under which we went into the IMF. Um, we are all members of the IMF, and so it's a body we go to when you have some macroeconomic instability. And so at the time I was president, yes, we suffered macroeconomic instability due to two factors, internal and external. External, you get shocked from time to time. We had the commodity price shocks, the slowdown in China, but internally, we overshot our expenditures because we introduced a new wage policy that um, uh, sought to y make the uh, remuneration in the public sector more uniform. And it shot the wage uh, bill far above what we had anticipated. Almost 73% of our revenues was going to pay wages and salaries alone. And so that forced us to go uh, into the IMF. Um, this government has twin problems. One is um, macroeconomic instability because expenditures far exceed revenues. Revenues are not performing properly. But then the second thing is also that they went on a borrowing spree and they've pushed our debts to, uh, le to levels that are unsustainable. Uh, just recently, the World Bank came and said we had almost 104% of debt to GDP. 
And so we have twin problems. One, to uh, achieve fiscal consolidation, and two, to um, uh, bring debts back to sustainable levels. So that's what they're faced with. Um, what I'll do differently, the economy is situated in an environment. It does not exist in isolation. And so there are some things that need to be done to create an environment for the economy to thrive. And some of them are governance issues, strengthening state-owned institutions, the fight against uh, 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 corruption, you know, and so many other things that create the environment for the economy to thrive. I think that if we go into this program and we bring debts back to sustainable levels and we are able to um, get the bridging facility in order to achieve policy credibility so that investors again feel confident that they can bring their money into Ghana, then we, c we must start from there and maintain that prudence. This should be the last time we go to the IMF. I mean, because going and coming and going and coming, I mean, it's, it's really, uh, it, it creates a certain instability in the whole system. And it, it also reduces the faith that people have in our democracy. One of the things that we will do when we come back, that's the NDC. I didn't say I, because we're not sure who will lead us. One of the things that we'll do is to, like I said, strengthen state institutions, strengthen the anti-corruption institutions, but most importantly, look at the constitution again. We've been operating this constitution for more than 26 years. And I think that the time has come for us to look at it again and do some tweaking in order that we can have a more uh, a proper constitutional environment in which to grow the economy. And so those are some of the things that we would look at. In four years, we have a four-year term uh, like they have in America, not like in other countries where they have five right. terms. And right. So there's very little you can do in terms of infrastructure. We'll do our best, invest in uh, the health sector, invest in education, invest in the economic infrastructure. But all this must be geared towards creating opportunities for especially young people, to be able to realize their full potential, be able to find jobs in the economy. I think that that's what, what, what we'll be looking at. And, and in your experience, does a loan from the IMF cure all economic ills? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. You see, um, what happens is you can implement a homegrown fiscal consolidation policy, which is what we wanted to do. But unfortunately, a lot of local and foreign investors, you know, would probably doubt that you can live by the promises that you make. Unless you have an institution like the IMF, you know, working together with you because they know that if you have the IMF supervising, they're going to be marking and making sure that you meet the obligations that you have set out. And that is why an IMF program becomes uh, important. That's why I said it's for policy credibility. But aside from that, IMF will give you money to show up your foreign reserves. And you need that money to stabilize your currency. And so if government is able to uh, reach accommodation with IMF, which will be dependent on if they're able to reach agreement with our creditors, because of the debt must come to sustainable levels before the IMF will give you a program. And so if they're able to do that, then the IMF will give Ghana, Ghana is looking for $3 billion. I don't know how much the IMF is going to give, but anything between $1.5 billion and $3 billion would help I show mean, up the reserves. I mean something similar to what Zambia has done. Yes, exactly. Our situation is similar to Zambia. Zambia had a twin problem, both the debt and fiscal consolidation. Correct. And now they've got a program. I think they have had their negotiations for Correct. debt sustainability and I think they are well on their way now. A lot of the economic turmoil that we've just been talking about and that we're seeing around the world is of course as a result of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. African countries have largely uh, avoided taking sides on the issue. At the United Nations, Ghana along with Kenya and Gabon voted to condemn um, Russia um, but then of course Ghana abstained on, on the vote to remove Russia from the human, UN Human Rights Council. In your view, were those the right decisions made by the current administration? I think that the world order is changing. Uh, you remember, we had the Cold War, and um, as a result of the Cold War, developing countries from the non-aligned movement, Correct. because we didn't want to be seen to be on one side or the other. You know, I think that we're, after um, the, the, the fall of the Iron Curtain, we had a period of globalization, and so, I mean, we thought that 
with the nuclear dividend and more money available, the reduction in the arms race, you know, things are going to get much better. Unfortunately, it looks like we're creeping into that, that period again. Um, I think that it's a period of adversity for the whole world because it's um, triggering a kind of global recession. Um, China and Russia and I don't know which other countries appear to be on one side and then the whole Western world is also on the other side. Already um, in Africa, if we need um, funding for infrastructure, big infrastructure projects, the place to go is China uh, and the East. Um, normally the Western countries would invest in the social sector, in education, in healthcare and things like that, but not big infrastructural uh, projects. I'll make an exception for the Millennium Compact, which uh, President Bush introduced and which Ghana has benefited from twice. But normally if you want to do a bridge or a road or a railway or something, often you'll go to, to the east. Um, at the last G7, um, the Western countries uh, talked about a 600 billion uh, a, a fund to assist Africa and other developing countries in terms of infrastructure. I know that the United States has put up the uh, DFC, I think it's a DFC, and they've committed about 100 billion uh, to uh, assist countries in critical you know, infrastructure projects. So it's an opportunity for us to uh, benefit you know, in terms of improving our infrastructure. But at the same time, it's an opportunity for us to look within and see what we can do better in terms of trading amongst ourselves. Happily, we've passed the African Continental Free Trade Area. And as I speak, the first commodities are beginning to be exchanged. Um, a shipment of tiles from Ghana, I read this morning, is going to Rwanda. And a shipment of tea is coming from Kenya uh, to, to Ghana. I mean, that's good news. I mean, we've been advocates of this for so long. We're happy it's happening now. 11% trained amongst ourselves. That's, it's, 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 it's ridiculous. And so we are hoping that this can push trade between ourselves even to 50% so that we're able to multiply the benefits within the continent, but also uh, get benefits from outside. Africa never got a Marshall Plan. After the war, Europe was rebuilt because America put up big money to rebuild Europe. Africa has never got that opportunity in terms of a Marshall Plan to build our economies and all that. Do you think Africa should ha there should be a Marshall Plan? Yes, after Africa. slavery. After slavery, I think there should be a Marshall Plan. I mean, slavery affected the continent very adversely. And um, I do believe that um, if a Marshall Plan was put up, you know, and we got the right leadership on the continent, and we do the kinds of things we're doing, trading, building the infrastructure on the continent, we can create a, a decent existence for our people. I have confidence that Africa is the next you know, uh, emerging continent, and it's going to be the next uh, frontier for investment and business. Well, um, from what they say, from your lips to God's ears, um, <laughs> Mr. Amen. John Dramani Mahama, the former president of Ghana, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for coming and speaking to us. We do appreciate it very Thanks, much. Thanks, Heidi. Thanks for having me. John Mahama there. And you can catch the full interview on our social media platforms. Go to Facebook at VOA Straight Talk Africa. And also you can find us on YouTube. Our YouTube page is VOA Africa. That's our show this week. Thank you for joining us on television, radio, and for streaming with us online. You can watch Straight Talk Africa on our website, voaafrica.com. And I'll see you next time. Goodbye.